Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. We're doing more on Maui. We're going to find out more from on the ground uh, from our correspondent, our host over there, who lives there, uh, Mahila Stoops. Welcome back to your show, Mahila. Thank you for having me um, on the show today. I'm able to actually uh, show my face, as you can see. And um, I, I think I, I want to start by saying that I have an amazing sense of calm and hope for what's happening. It feels like there's a significant difference between what was available and what was working yesterday and what's available and what works today. And it's almost like you were looking at miracles happening overnight in terms of what people can accomplish. Yesterday, I, I said, I particularly, I feel abandoned by county officials and I want to be more precise. And I want to say that our council member here in West Maui, Tamara Paulton, she has accomplished a lot for us starting, you know, um, before, during, and after the fire. And so I, I do want to, um, to acknowledge that. And I also want to acknowledge the councilwoman from Molokai that has co coordinated a lot of uh, support efforts. And I'm not sure about the other council members, um, but I, I do want to mention these two. Um, it feels like the federal, the state, and the county presence now, it is obvious. Um, it is working. Um, They're doing a lot of things to make the, to help this community run. And um, we're finally seeing progress in my, in my opinion. Things are, things are, we, we still have a long way. There's a lot of things to do, but it finally feels like things are getting better. Well, Mahila, can you can you drill down on that? Uh, can you tell us about what they're doing and the miracles that are happening, even from day to day? Can you give us some examples? Yeah. So you know the the first problem that we've had here, and I think that's the root of a lot of problems, was communication. Uh, being unable to communicate to people outside of West Maui um, created a lot of issues in terms of coordinating relief efforts, you know, even helping each other was very difficult because you couldn't, you know, I'm, I'm picking 10 pellets of water. Uh, I'm bringing them where over there, but the conversation gets truncated and it's like, where was it the Mala ramp? Was it, you know, Kahana ramp? Mala ramp is not usable anymore, but anyhow, I'm giving an example of um, how difficult communication has been just from a, uh, technology point of view and then in addition to that we're all distressed and it's hard to communicate efficiently when you're distressed and I that includes myself and you know so everything is harder to coordinate and harder to solve and so on because we're all traumatized en masse well, yesterday uh, we didn't we didn't have any uh, broadband with you, and so we had to talk on your um, the satellite phone. But today you have you have broadband. You're on your computer. What happened? Well, so I am. Um, um, I, I have had this available at my house, but uh, what's happened since yesterday? A lot of Starlink locations have been made available. Uh, hubs for that put out internet and there's more coming. Um, I am aware of uh, major efforts by, um, you know, privateer space company that is actually headquartered in Kihei, has been headquarters in Kihei uh, to set up these Starlinks. Um, they could, you, it's basically a device that can allow 200 people to use it, to use it at the same time. And um, so more of these are being uh, deployed. They're here, they're installed, you know, they require tech. It's, it's, it's not something you just place and you turn on and off. It's, you know, it, it takes time, but those are 
being made available. And I think it's going to get even better uh, soon with once we have everything we need. Um, I was told that I believe it's federal um, disaster management. I don't know the name of the entity, but it's a federal effort to put in um, cellular on wheels. It's like these big, you know, towers that would uh, allow um, cell and um, internet service. That I think a lot of the distress in the first two days were coming from the lack of communication, not being able to know who's alive, where are they, what can we do for them. And you can imagine 30,000 tourists plus locals trying to figure out what to do and being unable to find out where to go for shelter, where to eat, where to, you name it, you know, it's, it's, yeah. So that's the, uh, the, we, we already have power, I believe just about everywhere from, um, uh, basically kind of poly to north to Kapalua. So power is not an issue. Uh, we have- say that When you say that, you're, you're speaking about West, West Maui. But um, as we discussed before the, the show, in the absence of news, and you don't really have time to watch the news, you really don't know about the rest of the island. Am I right? No. No. So if there's an update for me, just give, is there a power outage somewhere on the island right now? I don't know. No. Um, but there is power in West Maui, just about everywhere. And, um, you know, which obviously allows for other things to happen. Um, you know, people can uh, turn on the TV. Uh, they may uh, connect and see something on the news. They, you know, they can cook a hot meal. Um, we are. I want to share with you that the local businesses have been absolutely amazing in providing for us. All the restaurants in West Maui have contributed in a phenomenal way, feeding all of us hot meals and there is an organization and I'm I'm apologizing right now because I think it's World Kitchen, something like that, that is also preparing chef quality meals that are brought to us and we could just go grab a hot meal and go back to work rather than figure out what do you eat, wash your dishes and all that kind of stuff. Um, there are efforts in place to improve access to medical. My, um, you know, my biggest complaint yesterday was about the uh, restrictions to travel, uh, you know, from West Maui to Kahului, which is the central area of Maui, a hub for everything that we usually need. Um, so I understand one good update that I know of uh, as right now is that if one has a medical issue is will be allowed to come into West Maui uh, through Maalaya rather than Kahakuloa. And that is very big. My first, um, I basically function as a dispatch. People call and say, I need this, I need this, I need this. Plus I'm calling people that I know and checking, I check on them to see how they're doing and you know, are they in distress or not. Long story short, my first call this uh, morning was, uh, I'm a resident of Lahaina. I need to be um, in Kahului to make uh, for, um, I believe it's treatment and testing in Kahului. I could drive there but I'm afraid to come back on the road through Kahakuloa. These were, I've never seen them. Somebody else contacted me and asked me to help them out. And um, it's, uh, they were elderly people and they said, we, we 
cannot drive through Kahakuloa. Can you find us a driver that would meet us in Kahului Thursday morning at 9 a.m. and drive our car back to our house in, La in West Maui? And then obviously that person find its way back to Kahului. And while I'm, you know, trying to find somebody to do all this, uh, an update came that the mayor is now allowing all people that are traveling for medical reasons to use that highway and come into West Maui, you know, on a road that is considered safe and uncomplicated. You know, Mahila, there was an article in the paper that the placard system that you spoke about yesterday was terminated. Uh, so the, they are no longer imposing that requirement. Am I right? It was terminated. And I have to say it was terminated because it was not safe what was going on there. It was so mismanaged by the county, meaning not enough personnel showed up to process the placards. There was no way to control crowds. There was no water, no um, tents. It's hot outside. Um, there was, they decided that this distribution center should be Napili Park, which is essentially the entrance to a cul-de-sac. There was no control of traffic. It was unsafe. And you already have people that are very traumatized you can't put them in harm's way again. So I think it was a very wise decision that was made right away. Cancel the darn thing, pardon my language. Uh, send everybody um, to whatever they wanted to do, you know, next on their agenda and figure out something else. And, you know, it doesn't make sense to me to hand out an orange paper to people. It just, it, it that uh, would not be checked by a policeman. The policeman would just see that there's a orange paper in the, um, in the windshield. That, you mentioned that, yesterday that um, you, you, know, you, you volunteered uh, starting right after the fires um, and you've been volunteering every day. This would be the seventh or eighth day already. And um, I guess my question is, how, how has that changed? Are you doing the same things uh, today that you did yesterday and before? Um, no. And if it has changed, who is directing you? Who is saying to you, Mahela, you should do this uh, and not that? Uh, who is who is uh, supervising you, Mahela? Right. So the first two days, what I had to do was find people, locate people. My people my immediate people they're all my people but there's my immediate people and there's the friends and friends of my immediate people and that was hectic uh you know you try and go find uh somebody through a group of 800 people spread over i don't know how many acres of maui prep property it was very difficult so that's what i did the first two days checking on people finding people and at the same time, providing whatever comfort, you know, here's hot food, here's some coffee, um, here I got some, uh, I boiled eggs to, for somebody. That, that was the first two days. After the first two days, um, when it became very clear who lost what, and the first news was there's loss of life and loss of property. I am very fortunate that as of now i don't know somebody directly but this is going to hit us like a tsunami when we're going to know who passed away and we're going to be grieving for all of them but the next two days we knew that building was burned that building was burned the next two days a lot of the communication on my end and what i did was essentially people does that still exist? Is it gone? Is it all I've said? It's 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 gone. It's gone. It's gone. That was the next two days, and then communicating with the families that managed to evacuate to the other side of the island that I could communicate with, 
and basically support them emotionally for their loss of their home, their business, their kids' school, their retirement investment or source of retirement. So that's what I did then. Um, from there, we had to move into how can we help these people? And, you know, because I am a real estate agent, it, it's intuitive that I would try to figure out housing. So that's uh, what, we're, so there was two kinds of housing needs, short term. So let's put them off somewhere for a month. Let's let's figure out a place where they could be, that they could grieve, they could, you know, search their for their family from. That that's why communication was so important. Um, that they could communicate, you know, like they could use a phone to call somebody or uh, some, and, and that was pretty difficult still through day three and four. Um, so. Now I'm moving in more into long-term housing and um, that's a, it has two other components. The kids have to be in school. We need to get schools started and functional ASAP. This is my next big miracle that needs to happen. And it needs to happen for everybody that wants to be in West Maui and wants to stay. The reason for this one is um, kids are traumatized. Secondly, parents need a break. They need to process, and it's hard to do this when, you know, you have to cover the needs of your child, um, every need of, that they may have. And um, also, a lot of people in the wider community need to go to work and make money. This is the reality of it. So, what I what I got next was a flood of inquiries. How am I going to make my mortgage payment? Am I going to get a paycheck on Friday? And I know there are many uh, employers and uh, business people that are working very hard to help their employees, you know, secure some sort of financial assistance. And uh, they probably already helped them find a place to be and live and all this. So. Um, this is what I'm focusing on right now. Schools, as many as possible, and housing as much as we can get, and work for the people that are here so that it keeps going. Mm. I'm going to give you a very simple example. We can't go to the bank right now. There's no bank, right? There's no more money in the ATM. There's no more cash. To, to get out, but we have these needs. And um, like, who's in the bank right now working? Who's go I'm sorry, who's going to come work for the bank? I heard that the uh, bank manager from Bank of Hawaii downtown had to uh, save her life and jump in the ocean. And she made it. Wow. So. So these people are not going to be able to come to work. The rest of us are having a hard time, you know. Well, you know, working. we've heard we've heard that um, you know, uh, uh, was it Jeff Bezos uh, was going to give a hundred million dollars? Um, people are, have been sending money on the GoFund GoFundMe website, in addition to food, clothing, blankets, what have you. Um, do, do you see any indication of that money? Um, and of course, uh, Joe Biden and his wife Jill are coming here. I'm not sure when exactly, but soon. And uh, presumably, you know, FEMA has money. Um, the federal government is supposed to, you know, treat this as an emergency, uh, and the state the same. Where is that money? Is that is that being distributed in some way to people who don't have money? Uh, where it, where is it going? It's trickling in. It's it's not a fast process, but I know there are very many efforts in place to disperse funds to help people. Kind of similar to I don't know what the state has prepared yet or federal, but uh, I know there have been various entities that you know uh, have disaster funds and they're willing to um, uh, uh, to to you know 
fund people for various things. I'm getting calls from some um, um, for, uh, some of the evacuees or some of the victims that are, pro are dealing with their insurance and they're getting some payments and they're getting coverage for some of their expenses or sometimes they're not getting everything because they didn't have the right kind of insurance or maybe because insurance companies may be a little difficult. But I think, um, you know, it is one step at a time, but it's also a long vision. Um, we, the, we want to, for West Maui and Lahaina to strive and to be the town that everybody wanted to see and be part of. And it's gonna take a while to get there, but we're, I'm, I'm very hopeful we're, we're getting there. And um, what yes. are your greatest concerns, Mahila? You know, some of these things happen fast and some of them not so fast. What are the greatest threats where things are not, cannot be, will not be delivered quick enough uh, and where you have to work harder to get people, you know, uh, service? I, I really want the mayor to reconsider this plan of accessing West Maui. I, I, I think it's a bad plan. I think that people have to be able to come and go on a safe road. That's mm -hmm. that's my my um, biggest uh, issue. I want people to be able to be safe and also to have access to service providers. Uh, the community has been fantastic. I've I've texts from um, uh, electricians and plumbers that are willing to do pro bono work and come here and prepare housing inventory for rentals and. Um, these, these are people from Oahu or people from Maui? From Maui, but they can't come through hmm. at all. That's a problem. So, yeah, and I understand the concern that, you know, there may be some bad actors and they, um, you know, may do the wrong thing. But by now, I, we have enough, um, you know, FEMA and state and federal and National Guard and all these, all these people are here. They, all they have to do is just whatever your concern that is, protect it better. That's all there is to it. And well, let traffic flow. We've seen photographs of, um, you know, of, of police and FEMA, National Guard, you know, protecting people's homes, what's left of them and all that. But there's another issue, too, we've heard about, and, and that's, um, you know, predators. Predators are out there trying to buy land cheap. Uh, predators who are out there to do scams on people in the name of helping them. Have you seen any of that? So, you know, as a real estate agent, I have a pulse on this and we are, I know our Realtors Association condemns any efforts to take advantage of the situation. I know numerous brokerages have paused all real estate activities uh, for at least 30 days. Um, I know that what's happening now, and I'm going to give an example of how I function. When somebody comes to me and they say, you know, I want a three bedroom house, um, I input their information in the MLS. And uh, when such a listing count appears on the market, then they get a notification. It looks like I'm trying to sell that to them, right? Well, one thing that I didn't foresee is that or I didn't think of is that these notifications are still in place. Mm. So some would still receive an email, even if I'm not conducting any business and we're looking into how to turn this off, all these, um, um, all these notifications. I know that there are call centers from the mainland that are calling people like they used to do before COVID, not, I'm sorry, before the fire, you know, it's like, hey, you know, I think your house is worth this. Do you want to sell it? I have an agent that could help you. This this happened before the fire and nobody's turned that off yet. So people are getting these calls. Uh, they assume it's from a realtor. I would assume the same thing, but it's actually a call center somewhere in, I don't know where. So what we've instructed everybody is when you get such a call, take their name and number actually just name and license number that was the request name and license number and we'll go after that i mean we as a trade association we don't want these people among us yeah 
Okay, well, you got to protect them because, you know, people are very vulnerable after a tragedy like this in so many ways. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you is, uh, you know, so I wake up in, in Oahu. It's a beautiful day today. And, and the buildings around me uh, that were here a few days ago are still here. Um, you know, my, my environment, my world is unaffected by what happened in Maui. I recognize that it will be affected. The economy of the whole state will be affected by by losing one of our major islands this way for an, uh, you know, an indeterminate period. But I wonder from the gestalt of it how, it, how it is for you. And if you, I imagine, this is my imagination, hmm, it's quiet. There's not that much happening. There's not that many, aside from you know, the volunteer situation that you find yourself in, there's it, not that much going on. And, and the weather is good. It's almost as if it's sort of this bizarre transformation from a vital, vibrant, green, active place and community to something where everything around you is dead. Uh, and it's, it must be weird. And the weather is probably just great, but it's really quiet. What, what's your gestalt feeling about that as it exists, as, is, as it is happening on Maui? Well, so I tell you what everybody that I know is doing. Waking up every morning after who knows how many hours of sleep, but not many. And you're like dispatch. And you get to a point where you say, okay, I need to take my kid to the beach or do something for my kid. And that's going to be my break. And then back to it. So it is, and it's very healing to help your community. I get so energized and uh, it keeps me going to be in touch with everybody and see how I can help and how I can connect them. And it, I don't, I, I can't um, being at home and watch the news and not doing something in the and I know a lot of the people feel the same. They want to do something. They want to do it as soon as possible. You talk about the community. You talk about people helping each other. And it strikes me that when you go out into the, into the shelter with 800 people around and, and lots of people who are working alongside or responding to you, you are meeting people that maybe you didn't know before. And now you have not only relation, you know, the sort of the uh, uh, the enhancement of relations you had before, you have brand new friends, brand new people that you didn't know before. What's that like? Yeah, you, you grieve with them. You ask them what they lost. This is the first question. The first question is, how are you doing? And they'll be, I'm okay. Or a very a, a, a certain degree of crying to I'm okay. That's the answer. And I am, even for myself, when I ask, are you okay? I'm saying I'm coping. That's what I'm doing. I'm coping. Will and you I, see them, will you see them again? Will you have relationships going forward? Have they become part of this very special recovery community that you've been describing? I, I think we've, we've become an even tighter community by helping each other. It's, it's the most amazing example of humanity. If you come here to the West Side and your foot on the ground and you see what's happening, you're going to have a lot of faith in people. And I have faith in all of our officials as well. I just think that they are not aware of the details of how we function by making decisions like you drive through Kahakuloa. Well, they've never driven it, but they're making that decision for us. You gather at Napili Park, 400 people. I, I don't know, they didn't look on a map. They probably haven't been here to see, wait a second, where are these people going to park? They're going to park on the other side of the street. 
you're going to cross the highway, right? So I, I have a lot of confidence in these officials, in their humanity, if they have the knowledge. Well, they got to be listening. they got to be watching. they got to be engaging the way you are. This is a learning experience, not only for you and the other volunteers. It's a learning experience for the entire community, the entire society in Maui. And it should be a learning experience for the whole state and maybe anybody watching the state. So this is uh, quite an experience, um, really remarkable. Thank you for sharing with us, Mahila. Uh, we'll circle back with you in a few days, if you don't mind, and find out how it's going, because I don't think we should forget Maui for one second. We should always have Maui on our minds. Thank you so much. We, thank you. And we appreciate all the love and the support. We really do, and we feel it. We feel the love. 